morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you are listening to Light Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we are discussing overworked designers, fader based consoles, and acting areas on Light Talk. And this is David in the beautiful Belmont Shore area of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. So welcome to episode 124. Hey, you know what what time it is? It is time to start school again. Everybody's starting school. So you guys excited about going back to school? I was until about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone knows I'm not going back. <laughs> You've graduated, David. I'll be back in January, but I am taking this semester off. I have officially retired from California State University, Long Beach, and I am now what they call a professor emeritus. Do you know what that gets me? Free parking. A library <laughs> card. And an office, believe it or not. Wow, that's pretty Yeah, cool. yeah, since we don't have no office We don't have space. enough offices where I work. So welcome back, Stan, and welcome back, Steve. Please. Where did we go? No, you're going to school. Welcome back to school. Oh. Be sure to bring your lunch boxes. That's all I have to say. I have a terrific uh, Remains of the Day lunchbox, by the way. If you want to borrow it, I can loan it to you. All right. So let's get on with the show. Steve has our first question. <laughs> okay. We have a question from Sarah in California, and she wants to know, can you talk about fader-based consoles versus software-based consoles a bit? Is a fader-based console still viable? And the short answer is kind of, sort of, maybe. <laughs> you know, when I, when I assume you're talking about a fader-based console, I'm making the assumption that you're talking about a preset console. And if that's what you're talking about, that's like lighting 101 right there. And fader-based consoles are still found in smaller installations. And generally the way a fader-based console works, if you don't know, it's generally a two-scene preset console. The faders are controlled on slides, and the uh, scenes can be manually adjusted by manipulating the faders. In one bank, you can build a queue, and in another bank, you can build another queue, and you can cross-fade back and forth. Where you're going to find fader-based consoles, I think, still dominant, are probably uh, in the DJ world because they give you a lot of flexibility. It's easy to grab stuff and move stuff around. Uh, and if uh, when we look at a software-based console, I'm kind of assuming you're talking about a, min a memory console. So I think that is what you're going to see a lot more of. And those memory-based consoles are going to be really popular in larger installations. And for the most part, uh, memory boards computer consoles, things like um, a Geo or a Neo uh, or, an, or the EOS family or any of those kind of consoles, I've pretty much uh, replaced preset consoles if the show is fairly complex. Uh, a memory-based console is going to allow you to set your entire show up, record it, and run it from a uh, basically an execute button, a go button. So if the show is fairly complex or if the cues are coming really quickly and you don't have time to set a preset, a memory-based console is what you want to go with. Also, I mean, there's less room for human error in a memory-based console. The other kind of console, and then I'll let Dave and Stan jump in here, uh, the other console you might be talking about is a moving light console, and that's kind of a hybrid. It brings some of the, uh, it brings all the benefits of a memory-based console into play and it still has some of the attributes of a fader-based console so that you can busk. The faders, though, are not simply a one-to-one -one connected to a light. They, they are programmable and much more, much more complex. Well, I was going to say, there's a, uh, one place where I specify fader-based consoles. Uh, well, actually, I usually specify a hybrid. It's a memory board with manual faders, is when I do Houses of Worship. Because you need something that's very simple for people who just want to use the hall or the worship space for something quick and dirty. And they don't want to have to go into the console itself and try to dig in and figure out how to record a cue. 
yes, you can have presets written for certain parts of, of the services, things like that. But sometimes you just want the front light up. Or sometimes you just want color wash in the back. Whenever I did a house of worship, I've always specified a board that will run both moving lights and memories, simple to program, and have an outdoor or side fader bank that people could, with very little training, bring up a fader, look, oh, well, there's the front light. I guess that's bringing up light on stage. A lot of these places, and I'm sure Stan will elaborate on this because this is what he does all the time, they can actually have faders on the wall that are connected to the lighting console. So you don't even have to turn the lighting console on manually. It's always there and always on. And someone just goes to the wall panel and brings up a fader. So that's one use for a uh, fader-based console. What do you think, Stan? Well, I think you guys covered it pretty well, but I'll just add a couple of things. I, all of the consoles that we have at school have a fader wing, and everything that we specify we, would be very rare that we would f specify a pure console without any faders you can put your hands on. Now, in a very, very tight financial situation where you can put something on a computer and get a, you know, a, uh, you're just running it from a mouse with no faders, that's what would be, you know, it'd have to be a really tight budget. And there's something really great about being able to put your hands on something quickly and bring it up. Let me give a couple of examples. In an emergency, you, you know, you put your house lights or your work lights or so, or nowadays, given the world in which we live in an emergency queue where all you've got to do in that emergency you don't have to do some keys i know people are fast with their keyboards i used to be lightning fast on a keyboard not so much anymore but you can't do that as fast as you can grab a fader and throw it up right so there's something to be said for that then another example where we find the the combination useful uh, we do a, ver uh, a BFA dance every every semester and the students get like 20 minutes to tech their piece it's a rep dance plot all the fixtures are on are systemized, so each fader has the system. And very quickly, you can build the queue from the faders much faster than you go, give me 20, group three at 40, and group, you can just slide them up, build the queue, looks good, boom, hit record, queue one, done, and they get a stack. They have to run from a stack because they do program A and program B, and they, they, it's not gonna, they couldn't run a two scene preset, but to get through the 20 minute time frame, which is what, the American, what is it, ACDFA, American Dance Festival, does. It's, you, get, you get a certain amount of time to get that cue in. So they're useful for that. Also, I would mention in the software, at least in EOS anyway, there are, if you don't have, if you can't spring for the physical fader wing, there are virtual faders. So you can have virtual faders on a screen and you can bring those virtual faders up. So I just think that um, it's it, if, if they were something to be, evolved away we wouldn't have them anymore so for whatever reason all those reasons we've kept faders available to us for you know those sliding potentiometers and bump buttons too usually below them or you can even run on the more sophisticated consoles you can run a Q stack on a fader you can run an effect on a fader so like on big like las vegas shows they might have you know or for even for it's like same thing on like in rock and roll which i'm sure you you put a whole song on a fader and you just push go on that fader the, the bump button becomes a go button so there's a lot of uses to the versatility of them and i i think they're going to be around a long time frustrated in california asks i'm at my wits end I teach at a university and have one student who cannot show up on time to crew call or meet a deadline. I think I have tried everything, but I am open to suggestions. <laughs> well, you called the right place. <laughs> we have a lot of suggestions. First of all, yeah, I think we've all run into problems like this. There's always a student, at least in my experience of doing this forever, who for some reason has a hard time showing up on time. And, you know, the first thing I do is I have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the student. I basically explain how theater works, that we're a team, and that if someone doesn't show up on time, it affects the entire team. And it shows that they're inconsiderate, right? So they need to make sure that they show up on time. If it continues, then I put them on probation. <laughs> it's that simple. I basically tell them, you know, you're not going to make it if you don't show up on time for crew call. And certainly for classes or for shows, things like that, you have to be punctual. Matter of fact, I've told all my assistants, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Anne says this in her book, that if the call starts at nine o'clock, 
being on time is a quarter to nine because you have to be ready to go. You have to have everything together. You need to make sure those focus tapes are out, all the paperwork's in order, so that when the crew does show up at nine, you just hand them the paperwork. Everything's ready to go. The designer comes in, everything's ready to go. That is really, really important. If I show up to a call and my assistant's not there, I'm telling you, I will never hire that assistant again. Because as a designer, I expect that assistant to be there before me. And again, this is something I learned from Gilbert and from Ken and from all these fantastic people who I was fortunate to learn under, is that you have to be one step ahead of the designer at all times. And if you're not, you're not doing your job. And part of that is being on time before the designer arrives. That's very generous of you, David, to do all that for the student. I think, um, you know, I just think about Woody Allen, who said, you know, half of life is just showing up. If you're not motivated, highly motivated to want to work in this field, the design fields in general, nobody could motivate you. And I don't think that's my job. Uh, I think I can help you, but motivation has to come from you. And if you are not showing up, you're in the wrong profession. There's just no, I don't, I don't know of an antidote to that problem and i just i don't i just <laughs> they're in the wrong profession yeah i mean what what's to say right you don't want to be here so don't be here you know stan right? i've had a student i'm sure you probably have students like this you you and steve where they may have been a new student and they may be shy or whatever and uh and i tell him i said your colleague was lighting a show on saturday she was here with the programmer and the director and they were lighting the show and you weren't now, maybe they weren't assigned to the show, but they should still be there learning from their other students. They should be viewing. They should be taking advantage of all this that they could learn, right? Yeah. And then, for some reason, the student still didn't come to other rehearsals. It's not like the student had a job, but they weren't there. I said, just come in for an hour. Come in for one hour on a Saturday just to see what's going on. The show support, right? Be part of the team. Yeah. It was obvious that the student did not want to be in the theater. And I sat down with the student. I said, listen, if you're not here, you don't want to be here, then you should not be in this business. Let me slice and dice this a little bit. I mean, let's say you had a student who's, you know, you did some lighting in church and you thought you loved it and you came to school to study lighting in the theater and you really didn't know what the culture was and what the expectations were, then maybe you be generous the first time and you explain all the things that you've so eloquently said, David, and that's fine. Sure. But beyond that, I mean, if you go to Mc, if you have a job at McDonald's, you have to show up for your shift. I mean, it's just it's just part of being an adult. So it is our job to help young people become adults, and I think there's a certain amount of forgiveness and explanation. But if the motivation, if you, if you're not hungry to do it, um, you know, find something else. I really don't have a, I don't, I don't have a magic bullet for that. And let's talk about the other part of the question. And that is about missing deadlines. Listen, in the profession, you cannot miss a deadline. A matter of fact, in your contract, there are probably some dates there for your deadlines of when the uh, lighting paperwork is due, the plot, things like that. There are reasons for these deadlines because without them, work cannot proceed. So it's really important that you meet all your deadlines and that's what you learn. That's part of the process that you learn in school. Otherwise, the whole process is held behind and it's a strong indication of not respecting your colleagues' work and the time it takes for them to do it. Steve, do you have a problem like this? So there's two things. I think we have to separate undergraduate from graduate. Sure. So, so I'm going to mark undergraduate off my list because I don't teach them. I teach graduate students. Uh, I think, and this has been around forever, so I'm trying not to sound like my father, <laughs> but I think this has been a problem forever. Sure. And I think, I think it's people who just don't have any skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sure, call starts at nine, but you know, I'm tracking follow spots and the follow spots don't really engage until 9.15 or 9.20, so why should I be there? I'm just sitting there hanging out. I could be doing something else. Um, yeah, I know I've got a budget of X amount of dollars, but I'm not too worried about that because I know, 
you know, if it's fairly important, then the department will pay for it and I'm off the hook. And if they don't, I'm off the hook. I, you know, I don't, I'm trying not to be, paint a grad student as cynical, but I think they're not aware of what the stakes are right now. You know, I just, I just had um, a grad student uh, graduate, leave the program. And this particular student is being highly recruited by two different manufacturers because they're very good at programming. Now, they're a designer also, but they really, they go kind of beyond uh, and understand not, th- not only the console, but the idea behind the console and why these two companies went in the directions they went in. Uh, but the reason they're looking at this student is because for three years they were always engaged. And whenever they came on campus to teach a class or to hold a workshop, that student was always a little early, always sat in the front row, always had a notebook. I mean, had skin in the game at that console class. And people remember that. So I think what happens with a young graduate student, I think you can be 40 and be a young graduate student, they just don't realize that uh, in many ways this is kind of it. They're in school. This is their last kind of bite at the apple to experiment and do wonderful things and do terrible things and no consequences. You know, grad school ends, and then you enter into the profession, and as you say, you know, a couple times showing up late or or having to ask the designer three times what they just said to you, uh, you get weeded out pretty quickly because there are people standing in line behind you who really want your job. So I, you know, I, I think the suggestions you're making are, are very good suggestions. Uh, and Stan has a point. At, at some point, we cannot live their lives for them. And at some point, this student, unfortunately, becomes a, a victim of their own bad habits and their own poor decisions. You know, it's, it's possible to be late. And there are legitimate reasons to be late. Uh, I'm late sometimes, but I, because of my theater ethic, if I'm going to be late because it's the traffic or I can't find the parking spot or, or I didn't leave enough time, and sometimes that happens because I need a lot of sleep, I pick up the phone and I call the people who are waiting for me and I say, I'm going to be five minutes or I'm, I'm, I'm en route or here's my situation. That's a common courtesy. So nobody's perfect. And yeah, you probably should have left enough yeah. time to be there on yeah. time. I think you're in a different uh, situation, Stan. You were not late when you were young and you were trying to get jobs and hustle. No, now it's, never. Now it's different. <laughs> it's different because for you, you've already established. That's true. And the expression in New York when I was coming up was... Back to Steve's, I think your point, David, about being 15 minutes early, the, the notion that we were taught was the, the first nail, if the call is 9 o'clock, the first sound of the hammer hitting the nail is at 9 o'clock. Not picking up the hammer, not bending, you know, that's when, that's when work begins. And it would end just as precisely. And, and just getting back. And I think Steve sort of nailed it on the head and so did Stan with the nails. Uh, <laughs> You know, people notice. Yeah, people do. People notice. You're trying to break in. Like Steve said, there are people behind you wanting to get your job, right? Don't give them a reason. The other thing here, too, is, um, you know, this person says they're teaching at a university. I don't know if you're an old, seasoned, experienced professor or just starting out. But let me remind you, other students are watching. And they're seeing how you're handling this student, and that can be real poison because they say, well, little XYZ shows up late, doesn't get his or her light plot in on time, doesn't come in at budget, doesn't seem to give a damn. Why am I here? It's not necessarily that that student's going to become a bad student, but they might start questioning why they're at that university. That's right. And they might start looking for a better school where they're going to be rewarded for their due diligence. Absolutely. That's a great point. I've had students come to me with that. I said, all you have to do is think about your own work. Don't care about that other person, what they're doing. I said, you need to focus on your own work. That's right. So if that ever happens to you, that's what you say. 
But again, getting back to the whole idea of what theater is all about, it's about teamwork. And you got to be a member of the team and support the team. If you're a football player and you're late for practice, guess what? You're suspended for the game. You know, that does happen. This is being called lately the whataboutism defense. So in other words, so you didn't, you didn't get your stuff together, okay? And so you point at the other person, the what about so-and-so and what about this one and what about that? It's not, it's not about the other. It's about responsibility for your own behavior. People are always watching. You're always being observed, and that speaks a lot about you. I'm going to end this with a quick story. I had a student once named Naoki Ogawa. We didn't know who this guy was. He wasn't actually a theater major. I think he was a chemistry major. And, you know, we're rehearsing a show, and we're, you know, in rehearsals. And the director comes up to me. She goes, who is that guy standing in the corner there all the time? He's been here for, like, the past two weeks. And I didn't know this guy, so I went up to him just to introduce myself. And I asked him, he said, I'm really interested. I'm, I, this is really fascinating to me. To make a long story short, he became a grad student of mine. He did incredible shows. Probably one of the most curious students I've ever had. And now is a great designer. That's the opposite of what we're talking about. Where you have someone who's so interested, they want to live in the theater. Paul, in our northern neighbor Canada, asks, are there any good apps of software for tracking a gel inventory? So I guess some people are still using gel. Uh, we do. We use gel. Uh, you know, I did a little research on this, and I, I didn't come up with too much other than I know you can do a certain amount of gel planning and cuts in within Light, right? I don't know if it inventories. I couldn't find if it inventoried full sheets, but it will actually create a gel order for you. There's this thing called Excel. There are things called, you know, FileMaker Pro that do all kinds of stuff. I don't know of a specific one that there might have been once upon a time Roscoe might have had something, I can't recall, that did gel inventory, but that was in the early days, and now spreadsheets can take care of that. But of course, it's only as good as the human being. You've got to, when you pull the sheet, you're going to have to log it out. And when you put a sheet in, you're going to have to log it in. So there's no way to, that, I don't think that can be automated for you. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, you are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by... Full Scale Institute of Nebraska. Are you tired of the drudgery of drafting? Spending hours creating CAD drawings only to discover that what you drafted will not work once the lights are hung. Well, it's time to skip those steps of haggling over a shop order and keeping it all within budget. It's time for you to live and thrive in an alternative dimension with our new software, Vaporworks, the Full Scale CAD program. Yes, that's right. VaporWorks full-scale CAD program will usher you into the exciting 21st century technology of full-scale drafting. Why bother folding and unfolding tiny little light plots? Use our full-scale plots and you'll never have to fold the plot again. Or hang it for that matter. Just enter the theater and carefully open your full-scale plot where the center and plaster lines intersect. And voila! Your lights magically appear where you want them to be. It's now time to focus and cue. Just be sure to unfold the plot in the theater. You don't want your entire lighting rig crammed into the production office. And Strike has now become incredibly efficient. Just light a match to your plot and all the lights disappear. Time to relax and head to the spa. So try VaporWorks Full Scale CAD program from Full Scale Institute of Nebraska. We get your lights hung quicker than it takes to order a cafe latte. <laughs> Available sometime in 2020. <laughs> you said cafe latte the way Kramer in Seinfeld says cafe, cafe latte. latte. <laughs> it's just slipped out that way. I don't know. It's staying. I love it. And now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> Well, the sound of those crazy ducks in the background, which I think one may be rabid, says that it's time for our Let's Talk About segment. LTA. We got a very interesting question from a listener that kind of is all-encompassing and actually has a lot of history to it. So I'm just going to tell you what the question is, and then we're going to talk about it. Why do so many people believe that the lighting designer is also the person to implement the lighting design? So I don't know. Let's open this up. What do you guys think about this? Back in the day, I think you had people who were electricians and designers or, you know, or the, the director sort of said what I wanted and the electricians hung the lights and turned them on and they were happy with that. I think uh, my colleague who's a, a 
Eastern European sonographer, you know, in in Europe, in some back in the, you know, in some places, it's it's the director or the scenic designer, the sonographer just asks what they want, and the electricians are very very artistically skilled and technically skilled. So it's evolved. I think as technology got more complex, you just needed more specialization. I can remember in grad school when I was being asked to light a show for the Honolulu Theater for Youth. And the fee was what the fee was, but they said, you're going to have to hang all the lights and plug them in and do the electrics work. And I said, oh, I'm not, I don't know if I can do that for that much money, and I'm not even sure I, I know you're a theater. So there, I think it's like if I can get both done you know, for the same number, we could. But I think things have just gotten more complex these days. But, but early in your career, I think people still, I don't know, I think I have students who came to me who were both being the electrician and designing the lights in their in a small venues uh, in big cities. So it's probably still going on. So what do I think about it? the professional level? I think that's not you know, that doesn't happen. But before you become a professional or you're, you're aspiring professional, I think it probably still does. Something we haven't talked about is that this is a problem at a lot of smaller theater programs. Uh, and yes. this is where we yeah. find the TD who is the set designer and the lighting designer, and sometimes he or she is also the production manager and hmm. teaching four classes, too. Right. I think uh, schools got on the bandwagon, uh, I don't know, sometime in the 70s, maybe even into the 80s, and had to justify the lighting design position. And one of the things they did to justify that position was this was going to also be the person who maintained all the equipment and hung and focused the show and was kind of doing this thing to relieve the TD so that he or she had opportunities to, you know, focus a little bit more in on their area of expertise. I do think it's, I think in universities and small schools, it is a money issue. Also, I think, you know, not all universities are made the same and there's no reason why they should be. Uh, but there are schools out there who happily have uh, five or six people on their faculty, and those people are directing and designing all the shows. And they don't have students who are capable of directing or designing these shows. They may have one, you know, everybody has one student every two or three years that's exceptional, I think. But for the most part, you know, here's a lighting designer. I mean, we've, we've all sat on tenure committees. And we see a, a tenure file that comes up, and that school has required that lighting designer to design the six-show season. And by the way, it's nice if they did something outside in the summer and wrote a book, too. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's an expectation. And lighting designers are being taught that. You know, also, uh, I think our way into lighting is through technology. So, you know, in high school, we're there. We're going to be the lighting designer for the show. And, yeah, we're probably going to hang it and focus it and run the board. So that's what you learn to do. Mm -hmm. And that carries over into college. You know, there was a really interesting lighting designer some years ago uh, who went by the name of Blue. And Blue did all these off-off-Broadway shows, and he was kind of amazing. He showed up with his 20 or 30 lights and cable and a preset board and an auto transformer, and he would hang and focus and run the shows, and they were they were quite amazing. And in regards to the kind of lighting designer programmer, I think that's been around for a long time in rock and roll. And that designer is out with that show, really kind of creating the work fresh every night. That's changed a little bit with the advent of moving lights coming in. You don't quite have the freedom that you once had to explore and uh, see what the rig was capable of doing. But even on those tours, the lighting designer, for the most part, unless it was you know a truss and a couple towers, was not the master electrician for the show. But he or she certainly was there in the trenches with the other person, helping set the show up, and then running it and helping it strike. So I, I, it's part of our industry. You know, why is the set designer also the props manager? or the scenic artist? Why is the costume designer also the, the chief stitcher at a summer stock theater? People, are, people have limited budgets, and they're looking to get the most bang out of their buck they can. And, and in this, I think there are no villains. I think this is part of the beginning of your career. And I think probably you would be happy if you were down at the bar doing it, and not so happy if you're working in a black box theater somewhere, because it's not as much fun, I think. Right. And this is where the union can help 
by having collective bargaining agreements and standardized contracts that specifically say what the duties are of the lighting designer, which they've been doing for years. But now we're moving into new areas like sound designers and projection designers. We pretty much know what is expected out of a professional lighting designer as far as deliverables and what they're responsible for out of a set designer, costume designer. But yeah, these new areas, we have to study them because there are misconceptions. For many years, the lighting designer was assumed that they would be responsible for special effects. Pyro. That's right. And you know, we've talked about this on the show before. Don't ever agree to be responsible for it because you are not trained for it. You're not licensed for it. You could burn down the theater. So make sure that you know exactly what the scope of your work is. And make sure it's written down in a contract. It doesn't have to be through the union. You can do it in your own letter of agreement. But make sure you put it down in writing exactly what the scope of your work is, that you don't end up being the master electrician. You know, small dance companies are really bad about this. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have a stage manager who's having to be the lighting supervisor. Right. And sometimes they can pull it off. But that's a long day. Because all of a sudden you're on the road and that stage manager is kind of production manager, stage manager, lighting supervisor. And maybe if they're lucky, they've got a costume supervisor with them. But all these kind of two-person small dance tours that go out, I mean, it's it's a long, hard day. That's traditional in dance. It was like that. You know, I mean, that, that, you had the stage manager also the lighting. Look, I can remember when, you know, if you did lighting, the ass was, oh, can you do sound too? You can probably do the sound, right? Because there were no sound, you know, in schools, and right. schools primarily. And then I remember when sound became a USA uh, covered area as well. It's like, you know, it all comes back to that, you know, do I have to pay for this stuff? Can I, can, don't you guys just do this for love? I mean, that's, you know, I could, oh, get, I could get cynical, what you know. What I did for love. Uh, right, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, how much can I get out of one person? So Steve has the last question of the day. It comes from Denny in Hong Kong. And Denny writes, I am confused by acting areas versus focus areas. Aren't they the same thing? This is, this is a common misconception, and it could be simply a, a language thing. But a lot of people confuse this. Another way to think about it is think about an acting area and think about an area of control. So let's say I have nine acting areas on stage. Maybe I need nine focus areas or nine areas of control for the front of house. Let's say I have backlight. Maybe I take those nine areas and areas one, two, and three become one giant focus area. And areas four, five, and six, one giant focus area. And seven, eight, and nine, one giant focus area. So I wouldn't worry too much about the semantics of acting area versus focus area. I would think about areas of control. And that's going to change from scene to scene, page to page. And you and the director, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he, he or she wants something center stage. And you think, ah, I've got an acting area here, and it's an eight-foot pool of light. Well, maybe the director is using 20 feet, and that requires several acting areas to be turned on. So that's an area of control or a focus area. I, I think it's probably simpler. You're probably making it, you're thinking too much about it. But also focus areas or focus points are used with moving lights. A lot of times the designer will work with the programmer to make sure that all the lights or a certain number of those lights are indeed focused to these focus areas and record them into presets so that they could be recalled easily later on when you're programming the show. Usually I give a focus map to my programmer before we even begin, basically telling the programmer, I want these lights focused here, these lights focused there, this focus point, that focus point, and they can sort of rough those in while I'm out focusing the conventional lights so that we're all ready to go when we start programming the show. So uh, I, I think whatever works for you is gonna work fine. So, that Hammond organ solo tells us that once again you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on our Facebook group. You can hear our podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Google, TuneIn, and now on livedesignonline.com. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. 
No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. And that's for sure. But just in case you choose to litigate, our law firm of Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and deep in the heart of Texas. And be sure to tune in next week where we interview longtime mover and shaker in the lighting tour industry, Steve Terry. All of that and the new sponsor, Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. So long, everyone. Talk.